Reverend Stephen Jenkins is thrilled to return to the Stanford Digest. Yeah. He sends his best wishes to old and new friends in Dallas. Uh, Stephen's been an associate chaplain at C.C. Young, a liturgist at Highland Park United Methodist, and a Methodist minister in the North Texas Conference. Uh, he's an international public speaker, a naturalized American citizen. Uh, his bishop in the Free Church of England has given him permission to stay in the U.S. as an emissary on a permanent basis. He's currently studying and assisting two new reformed Episcopal Church plants in Waxahachie and Rockwall. As an adjunct lecturer at Richland College, he mentored many international students. His plans for the future include carrying on his presentations and also returning to independent retirement living as a chaplain. Uh, that's his strong church vocation. Or, or possibly working in senior adult ministry in a church setting. Stephen looks forward to less international travel, being with his two sons here, and a continued ministry in the adopted city of his wife and family, Dallas, Texas, for the last 27 years. And now Stephen Jenkins brings us John Cleese, A Monty Python Life. Thank you, Richard, and good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, whatever time you're listening to this, to old friends and new ones that are kind of tuning in. So the presentation today is John Cleese, A Monty Python Life. And we have a quote there on the board on the first uh, slide. Uh, John Cleese, great comedy actor, of course, writer, teacher, as we'll find out, teacher and professor, uh, philosopher interested in psychology, and great entertainer. This is what John Cleese said about uh, creativity. I thought I would start with that, him being such a creative person. This is the extraordinary thing about creativity. If you just keep your mind resting against the subject in a friendly but persistent way, sooner or later you will get a reward from your unconscious. So uh, here we have a collage of some of the more famous scenes from John Cleese's life, from Monty Python, the class sketch, the silly walk, all that sort of thing, and his mother. Um, I was interested in the fact that uh, recently Cleese said in public that one movie that he really wanted to make, but Hollywood would not make for him, was a movie about 1776. And this interested me because the great director, uh, Lord Sir Richard Attenborough, always wanted to make a, a movie about Thomas Paine. And Hollywood said, no, no, we're not going to finance that. And he never did get the money for it. And Cleese, in the same way, has been trying to make a movie about 1776. And he had this scene in his mind, talk about being creative, a scene to open the movie, of course, humorously, and he has in the trenches the colonial revolutionary forces on one side, panning into that, and on the other side he has the British forces. And out of the British forces, which are, are actually German Hessian mercenary troops, uh, the line comes out, das ist wunderbar, ich bin glücklich. And from the revolutionary side who heard them talking like this in German, they said, damn British. So that's the kind of creativity that is running around uh, his mind. So uh, typically, what I like to do, those of you who have seen me talk before, is I'm very interested in people's childhoods. And we're, so we're going to talk a little bit about uh, John Cleese's uh, childhood uh, here as we go through. So here we have a picture of John, uh, an only child and his mother, um, and so typically with only child, he was probably a bit lonely. He's really grasping that teddy bear really tightly there, and he's probably, I don't know, a little bit old for a teddy bear, but there, there he is. And his mother is uh, an interesting character in his life, as they always are in all our lives. His mother's name was Muriel, and she was a great warrior. And uh, John said, and she lived to 101, John said he used to visit her uh, down in Western Supermare. That's where they all uh, uh, used to live, spent her whole life there. And she would write all her worries down on a piece of paper. And uh, she, the only, she did that, John said, 
so it was therapeutic, so that she felt that if she could get them all down on paper, it would keep them away, it would keep them at bay. Um, she was also prone to tantrums. Um, and also, John said about her uh, and later problems he had in his life uh, with marriages and, and, and women and, and relating to women, he said, it cannot be co coincidence that I spent a large part of my life in therapy. Um, most of my problems uh, came from women um, and the fact that I'd been to all boys schools and then on to university, which was an all uh, male uh, environment. Well, John had moved 11 times by the uh, age of uh, 13. Uh, many of those moves were taken. He was born in 1939. The family were, uh, had a great fear of being bombed, and West Country was bombed just as much as London uh, to a certain extent. So they used to move around rented homes. Um, and so he had a kind of uh, traveling existence uh, there. Um, now we come to his father. His father's name is Reggie. Uh, and it says at the bottom, Reggie, dad, had a kind face. John's a little bit older there. He looks a lot more relaxed with his father. He did get on very well with his father indeed. Um, Reggie had been to World War I and um, was so teased about his family name. The actual family name wasn't Cleese, it was Cheese. And so um, as soon as he could, after resurfacing from World War I, uh, he changed the family name, just one letter, to Cleese, uh, so that his son wouldn't get teased uh, so much about it as well. He once said uh, that living with Muriel, his wife, he uh, probably preferred to be in the trenches in World War I in most days. So you can tell with Muriel uh, what a difficult existence probably was in, in that house. Reggie was an insurance man. Uh, he was good at his job. Uh, average wage in the 50s when John was growing up was 10 pounds a week and Reggie used to earn 30 pounds a week. Um, and with that extra money, uh, they sent, they, they, because he was an only child, they gave him a private education. Uh, John used to go for long walks with his father, and the father used to tell him jokes like, why do the French like civil wars? And John would say, I don't know. Why do the French like civil wars? And Reggie would come back, well, it gives them a chance to win a war. So it was that kind of joke that he would tell, very British kind of joke. Um, and also, um, there would be a serious animosity uh, in the family, which is un unusual to Welsh people. Uh, don't forget the west of England is still Ke is Celtic, yes, but it's, it's still uh, very English. Uh, but Reggie had come, uh, although they were Church of England, from a Jewish background, and they had lived in, before John c uh, came on the scene, as it were, in Golders Green, which is a very Jewish part of London, and got on very well uh, with the people there. So there weren't any Jewish jokes uh, in, in the family there. Now, the uh, next scene is John's preparatory school. This is the private school that I talked about that he went to. It's called St. Peter's. Uh, it's in Weston. He was very happy there. So although perhaps at times he felt under stress at home, uh, particularly with his mother sometimes, he was very happy at school. He loved this school. And we'll return to this in a moment, because he actually returns to it um, as a teacher, if you can imagine that. Um, and so I'll just say a little word about what a preparatory school is. Um, one of the reasons I'm very interested in John Cleese is I taught myself in a preparatory school. I was an educator. I'm also from um, the same part of the West Country as he's from. Um, so, and I can identify that part of his family background uh, read it readily. In fact, John said, so can uh, understand this, uh, because he did have psychological difficulties with his wife. Um, who doesn't, you know, particularly with lockdown at the moment? He said that um, uh, he could go to a place in his mind, which was Somerset, um, with the rolling fields of Somerset, the West Country, and he could relax himself just go by, by going back 
to those places, to the, to the summer months, which is all we normally remember, to the lush green fields of Somerset, and to the great history of Somerset, which he was going to recreate in one of his um, movies called Monty Python and the Search for the Holy Grail. Because Somerset has a great, great uh, history, going back to the Arthurian legend in Camelot uh, and all that uh, sort of thing. So moving on, when he becomes older, this is John at age 13. Uh, he is going to a prestigious school called Clifton College. You note from the college part of it, it wasn't a, an ordinary school, as it were. Um, and he's just done his scholarship exam, and he was given uh, uh, some reduction in fees because he was very good at science. And he's walking out, and you can see a big smile on his face. He knows he's done well in the, in the exam, probably. He's confident about that. Um, and look at the height of him for a 13-year-old. In the 1950s, he's six foot which in England at that time was quite unusual. So he was always, um, always very tall. Uh, here we have another scene from uh, Clifton College. This is the exterior of it. Uh, this is a scene I'm very familiar with because I was in an independent private school that we used to go over there and play cricket and rugby. And this is the famous Close. It's a beautiful setting. On the left is the chapel, which was a very important part of daily life for, for John Cleese in the mornings, morning prayer, and then the actual uh, college itself. And there's, of course, a cricket match going on there. And uh, John was very interested in cricket, uh, actually a good cricketer. Um, he liked soccer as well. He didn't like rugby football. He didn't like the contact um, of, of rugby football. But the education he would have got there in this Anglican school would have been very similar to that that uh, FDR got at Groton College at his Anglican school, and also that Winston Churchill got at, um, at um, Harrow School uh, in, in North London. And the reason I say that is, and something I learned from doing this presentation, there is um, a very, this, this school has some very famous um, people that went there. One of them is a leading poet uh, and educationalist called Sir Henry Newbolt. And he wrote a poem about this, which exemplifies the way British education was at that time and carried on actually into the 60s for a very, very long time. Um, and the poem he had is uh, about uh, team spirit, about looking after each other, because schools such as this prepared people for service in the British Empire, for, for, arm, for the army in India and all over the world, for the civil service, for the priesthood uh, in churches, missionaries, all that kind of thing. I just want to give you a little snippet of this famous poem called Vita Lampada, which means the joy, the torch of life. And he's writing about this cricket match, but he's also talking about the service that these young men will do, often laying down their lives, either as missionaries or soldiers, uh, later on. Here it is. There's a breathless ho hush in the close tonight. Ten to make and a match to win. The Gatling's jammed and the Colonel's dead, but the voice of a schoolboy rallies the ranks. Play up, play up, and play the game. So that's talking about duty, uh, the duty that lays before these boys, which will often be uh, extremely, extremely uh, dangerous. But it's also talking about sportsmanship. And in a professional era, when people get paid $60 million for signing a contract, um, it's, this would be out of, the, out of the realms of understanding of most people in England right up to the 1960s. So it was a different world. Sport was amateur much emphasis was placed on team spirit and supporting uh, each other. Right, the next scene is, well, John was at Clifton, he got into acting, um, and here he is as Lucifer, the devil, in, in the famous play uh, Faustus. So he already explored, um, explored a, um, a 
talent for acting, if you like, very early on. Um, the other thing I forgot to mention about John, his middle name is John Marwood Cleese. Now, Marwood is a very old Anglo-Saxon word, meaning um, the Marwood. So Mar is, means evil, and wood means the wood. Uh, so um, he has that ability to play these very severe characters. And he has this very unusual, very old um, name there um, of Marwood. Right, so here we have John Cleese with a beard. And um, he gained a scholarship also to Cambridge University. When he left school, he was a bit disappointed. I think that was probably just his pride because he failed with all his talents, sporting talents and academic talents and all the, reward, all the praise that came with that. They didn't pick him out as a leader. And in schools, that's very important. So he didn't become what's known as a prefect, which is a senior boy that has a lot of privileges. And he was very disenchanted with that. So I think he was always ambitious. But I think there was a certain amount of pride there as well, which we, which we all have. But he did get that scholarship to Cambridge University. But it was an uh, entry into university which was delayed by two years. And the reason it was delayed by two years is we had a lot of um, servicemen coming out of World War II who were given priority for universities. So one day he had a phone call from his old headmaster. Remember, he went to St. Peter's School. And the headmaster um, said, I hear that you're, you've been delayed going to university. Would you like to come to St. Peter's to teach um, for uh, some time before you go up there? So he accepted it. And he went to St. Peter's. And here he is um, uh, with a beard, ready for teaching. Um, he talks about this in his biography. Uh, so anyway, and I do recommend it to you. It's very much on his early life, but also his later life. And he spends probably 30 pages talking about this two years of teaching there. Again, he was very happy there. He enjoyed it. It was an old male environment. He enjoyed that. Um, and he also enjoyed the challenge, because although he had a degree in science, when he got to the school, um, the headmaster, he had said to the headmaster, what would you like me to teach? And he said, well, I want you to teach history. And he said, but I didn't study history. He said, doesn't matter. All you've got to do is keep one page ahead of them in the classroom. And so for two years, he kept one page ahead of the classes he was teaching. Now, you might say, well, that sounds ridiculous. But no, it's not. Because from my experience of teaching in those kind of schools, when he was teaching the scholarship class, they're 13-year-olds, but they have a knowledge of 16, 17-year-olds. And so he just about managed it, but he did enjoy uh, his time there. So we've got him to Cambridge now, but you may think he's in a law court. But here, he immediately joined the Footlights, the Cambridge Footlights uh, Amateur Dramatic Club. And this is a club that also Prince Charles joined as well. It's a very famous club. A lot of actors have come out of it. And here is a scene from a British courtroom. And Cleese is playing a barrister there, an advocate. Um, and so uh, his time at Cambridge, uh, doing his science degree, he did a lot of acting there uh, as well. Um, actually, I think I've misspoken. I've just said he got a scholarship for science. He did get the scholarship for science. I don't think I misspoke there. But he changed his degree while he was there. I don't know if it was the effect of this play. But he changed the degree to law. So he studied law for three years um, while, while he was there. And uh, in the end, he never ended up going into law. Uh, in fact, he was headhunted by a very prestigious chamber in London. Um, and but that would have meant he'd have to study for another three years in chambers um, and take more instruction, so a six-year course to be a barrister. So, but while he was there, which was not unusual, the people from the BBC and the theatre often, and still do, 
go and look at the plays there, aspiring actors and actresses. And he was picked out by the BBC, who offered him a contract um, and actually a lot more money than the law firm initially was going to offer him. But for Cleese, you know, in his life, it wasn't always about money. Um, but when you're young, it tends to be more about money, doesn't it? Because you're starting out in life. But he did love acting, and he did make it, uh, and he still does uh, enjoy making, uh, making, people, uh, making people laugh. And so we come uh, via, this is one of the sketches that uh, actually he toured uh, with this. Um, this is a sketch called The Chinese Song. And he puts in his book, this was now deemed unacceptable now. You know, he's very big into political correctness, but he, even he will realize that this is, you cannot do a sketch like this now. But um, he took this actually on tour uh, with a theater group uh, to, to New Zealand. And funny comment he made about New Zealand, he said it was 1967 when I took this particular sketch to uh, New Zealand. But when I arrived in New Zealand, it was 18, 1863. Um, but back at the BBC, uh, he joins uh, a very successful program headed up by David Frost, who became Sir David Frost, who's very well known on this side of the Atlantic. And this was a weekly program called The Frost Report. And before that, there was a program called That Was The Week That Was. And there were some, uh, it was actually a satirical program. Uh, the 60s very much was satirizing the old establishment ways of England. And Cleese uh, really, um, really wanted to be a part of that. He saw many of the things, looking back, in his education and in the current government that was there that he did not uh, agree with. So he wasn't by nature particularly uh, conservative with a small c. He was uh, more uh, a liberal democrat, if you like. Um, but he uh, got into writing here, helped write a lot of the sketches for some of the quite famous people there. There is Ronnie Barker, Ronnie Corbett, who you've seen on screens over here in America. And also the gentleman in the bowler hat at the, at the left there is uh, Nicholas Smith, who went on to be the manager uh, in um, uh, Are You Being Served in the department store. Uh, so, but this was a um, very popular program in England because the government was very unpopular and it was to change. The nature of it was to change. And I think the influence of it culturally was part of the reason that it did change. Uh, and this is one of the sketches from this particular program. And this sketch hones in on the class system in England, which is a little bit more subtle now, but is still very much there. Believe me, every time I go back to England, I personally feel it as well. So here we have John Cleese in the uniform of the 60s. You don't see it so much now, but occasionally you will see it. Um, everybody wore hats in those days, and it was like a uniform. So John Cleese is upper class. And always throughout his life, he played upper class people. He came um, out of that system, a public private school in Cambridge, and he could carry it off really well. He's wearing a, um, what's called a uh, bowler hat. And these are the people that would work in the city in London. And you know, thousands of them would march across Westminster Bridge like an army, and a few still do, going into the city. And this was to show by your hat that you are upper class. Now, in the middle is Ronnie Barker. We were talking about him just now. He's wearing a trilby hat. And a trilby hat, I mean, I wore one of those myself um, uh, in the late 60s when I went through a hat period of trying to be older than I was. A trilby hat signified you were a middle class. And then little Ronnie Corbett in the end with his cloth cap and disheveled scarf and kind of dirty raincoats is supposed to be working class. And so the sketch went something like this. John Cleese would say, I look down on him, looking at Ronnie Barker, the central figure, because he's middle class. And 
Ronnie Barker in the middle would say, I look up to him, John Cleese, because he's upper class, but I look down on Ronnie Car Corbett because he's working class or lower class. And the punchline of this sketch is, Ronnie Corbett would say, I look up to both of them because I know my place. Britt was very good about people knowing their place in, the, in those days. Here we have um, uh, John Cleese's first wife. Um, he had four wives. I have to be careful. I have to write them down in order, like when I teach about Henry VIII, so six wives, and Cary Grant with his five wives. So I've got a little list here if I get stuck. Um, first wife there. This is Connie Booth. And um, she is famous um, for helping John Cleese write the very successful TV series. There were only two series. There were only 12 episodes, 40 Towers. Yeah, and she played a, a pivotal part in that acting, but she also helped him write it as well. After her acting writing career, she became um, a psychoanalyst. And there are two wives that were psychoanalysts. And please talks about that a little bit uh, later on. Um, Connie went on to, as I say, become a psychoanalyst. They had uh, one daughter, um, and she became an actress. And so John Cleese actually has two daughters. Uh, they both became actresses. Um, they had both they had a difficult relationship with both of them for a time, particularly his second one, uh, uh, Camilla. Uh, but that's Connie Booth, that's his first wife. I'll talk a little bit of, briefly about the other ones. Uh, his second wife was Barbara Trentham, who was an American actress. And each of these marriages lasted 10 years. And I think probably that tells you something. Each of the marriages lasted 10 years. Um, and then his third wife was a woman called Alice Eich Eichelberger. Uh, who also, um, like Connie Booth, studied in London and became a psychotherapist. Uh, and John talks about his third wife like this, and he also talks about his daughter's similar vein in a kind of disparaging way. He says, you know, he never really understood women because of the background he came out, which was all male. But he talks in a grudging way about um, the divorce settlement, particularly from... Alice Eckelberg, which was $20 million. Um, and he, he, he paid it all back, but it was over a number of years. So he did pay it all back, $20 million. But he, he had to go on a tours, a lot of tours and work very hard. One of them was called the Alimony Tour. Um, so those are uh, his wives there. And it's interesting that he, his, his interest in psychology first started with conversations through two of them um, when he was trying to make sense of his life and come out of um, his uh, depression. But he, Cleese, in his book, is very cynical about his wives uh, and daughters, uh, which is not a very admirable trait, um, but it's certainly there with him. Um, moving on a little bit. Right, so this is probably the thing Cleese is most famous for, particularly in the United States, as Monty Python. The Monty Python shows from, from the 60s, um, and they are very famous episodes indeed. Uh, were very successful in England, but probably more successful here. The humor was very um, different. It was uh, very much satirical. It was very zany. I can remember when I first watched it, some of the things I found funny, some kind of went over my head. Um, but he's there with some very talented people. The man with the pipe at the back uh, is uh, Graham Chapman. And, um, and John wrote a lot with him, co-wrote with him. And then you have Michael Palin, who's now Sir Michael Palin, who's often on British uh, and American television. Uh, all good actors. And, all, and then Eric Idle, who's absolutely brilliant there. Eric Idle, who wrote that wonderful song, which sometimes I sing to uh, cheer myself up with, Always Look on the Bright Side of Life, uh, which became a, a great uh, hit. So it was very zany humor. 
Uh, and in the United States, probably one of the reasons it was very successful is the baby boom generation. I didn't have to go through that in England because we didn't go to Vietnam. For, the government didn't allow us to go to Vietnam or didn't, didn't sanction us to go to Vietnam. But I don't know how I'd have felt about it if it had happened. But certainly, a lot of baby boomers did go to Vietnam here. And uh, when they came back, uh, they entered the universities, or before they went, they were in the universities, and many of them have said that it was Monty Python uh, and the humor of it that kept them sane in the very, very difficult times that America uh, went through in the 60s. Uh, Monty Python entered into the culture of England as well. I'll give you an example about that. Uh, Mrs. Thatcher even used it as a joke in some of her speeches. So Mrs. Thatcher, when talking about an opposition party, small one, trying to get going, um, described it as an ex expired party. And the reason she ex talked about it as an expired party was from this very famous sketch, the dead parrot sketch, um, which is a really, really funny sketch. If you haven't seen it, go and look at it on YouTube, the dead parrot sketch. And Mrs. Thatcher brought the house down by calling these political rivals an expired party, and then she said the catchphrase from Monty Python, and now for something completely different. Ma Margaret Thatcher was not a natural joke teller, but her script writer had written that in for there. But it's just an example about how it went into the uh, national uh, culture. Um, and this went into the, uh, became very famous, the Ministry of Silly Walks. Um, and John Cleese himself said he didn't like doing this, he didn't find it very funny, but a lot of people uh, really did, the Ministry of Civil War, making fun of the establishment in England, uh, the civil service, the people who uh, run the country. Um, we have kind of a love-hate relationship with some of them, and that surfaced recently, uh, in recent days. Uh, after this, Cleese went on to make uh, movies, um, and before we get to this next slide, I'll talk a little bit about the movies he made. One was called The Life of Brian, which was very controversial in this country uh, and was uh, banned by, uh, in some countries, and felt to be disrespectful to people of faith. They didn't mean it to be like that, but it was taken like that. But it was very near the bone for a lot of people. Uh, in Europe, because it's more secular, it didn't really matter for a lot of people, but The Life of Brian. But the more popular film here in the United States was um, Mon Monty Python and the Search for the Holy Grail, the Arthurian legend, uh, and also The Meaning of Life. That was another uh, movie that was particularly uh, popular. Let's talk a little bit now, a little bit about um, books that John... So I'm giving you some th things to follow up on. I've already talked about his autobiography, so anyway, is very good. Uh, quoted from it a lot of it. Now, uh, Cleese became so, and this has a Dallas connection. Um, Cleese became so interested in psychology, um, he kind of sat at the feet and learned from a doctor called Dr. Robert Skinner, who was a psychiatrist. And um, they co-wrote together in the form of conversations. They're very easy to read. They're not theoretical. Well, this was uh, one called Families and How to Survive Them. That would have been a very good book for lockdown. Um, and then uh, other books also that uh, he wrote. And Dr. Skinner, I think one was called Life and How to Survive It, the other one. Dr. Skinner uh, had a practice here in Dallas for about 10 years and did research here uh, in, in Dallas uh, on, on psychiatry. Uh, we are jumping a little bit ahead, actually, um, onto books. I, I must, a bit remiss of me, not to re re recall the probably one of the most famous films uh, that Cleese was in, which he wrote and he was Oscar nominated for, and that was A Fish Called Wanda uh, with Jamie Lee uh, Curtis. So he got that recognition from his fellow people for his writing before he started to write and to get into books uh, itself. A Fish called Wanda. Uh, so we talked about the other book, which was called A Life and How to uh, Survive It. And so these were very, very interesting books, and I commend them to you. Um, and this other book here, uh, which we're going to finish, we're coming towards the end now, 
finishing up on. This is something many of you may not know about John Cleese. Um, he has a, he's very interested um, in teaching, obviously, because he had that in his background. And at one point of his career, he talked about going back into teaching in schools because, you know, Hollywood wasn't um, uh, floating his boat enough, if you like. So it wasn't all about money for him. And then later in life, he became interested in universities. He was given an honorary uh, position in England at St. Andrews University, a very prestigious university, actually, which Princess Kate and Prince William went to. Um, he was made rector of the university and uh, brought in some reforms which were very advanced during that three-year period. And uh, he's always been interested in young people. So when Cornell University in the US approached him and said, would you like to come and lecture here? And he said, well, what do you want me to lecture about? And the dean said, well, just come uh, over and shake things up a bit. So that was over 15, 18 years ago. And he's been going there regularly for 15 and 18 years for up to about a month at a time. And this book was published, which has his lectures in. And I commend this book to you as well. Um, it has lectures on all sorts of things, screenwriting, but also um, religion and faith. And during his time there, he actually get that one of the essays is a sermon, which he gave in the Sage Chapel. And uh, I, if you want to know more about this, I commend this YouTube to you. Um, it's called John Cleese at Cornell University. Uh, this is one of the deans there interviewing him. It is very, very funny, but it is also serious and very profound when he talks about creativity, uh, when he talks about his life, um, when he talks about uh, the United States. One of the things, interesting enough, he says about the United States, and the United States has been very good to him. He has a very big following here. Financially, it's been very good to him. Helped pay off that 20 million alimony for a start. And he has a big following here. Whereas in England, uh, he is kind of um, still revered. Those 40, 40 Towers programs have been voted some of the best comedy ever seen in England. But because of his views on political correctness, and England has become very political correct, politically correct, um, he, um, he is the BBC, and this is a source of um, uh, irritation to him, let's put it like that, have not been showing, for, for instance, one particular, um, uh, one particular episode from uh, 40 Towers uh, was when a German group came to the hotel in, um, uh, in Torquay. And uh, at one point, he goes and tells his wife, Connie Booth, be very careful with the Germans. Don't talk about the war. Well, the BBC would not show that program now because they're saying that's not politically correct. But he, he talks about humor. And if you start censoring it like that, it ends up with very kind of anodyne uh, things which aren't quite so funny. So, but in the United States, it's been very good to him. And interesting enough, at the end of the program, you can tell he has this great affinity with the students and the Q&A. And, &A, and uh, they, they, they keep asking him back. He said, I'm always amazed that they keep asking me back. They keep making new titles for him to go back to Cornell. Uh, at the end of, end of it, he says, and I would concur uh, with this, he says, America has been very good to him. And he has also noticed during his time here, he actually lives in the Caribbean. Um, because of, I think, tax purposes, basically. But he enjoys the Caribbean as well. And um, his fourth wife, he lives with his fourth wife uh, there. But he says, as he travels around American universities and sees institutions here, he says there are many fine, uh, high standard, excellent institutions here. And I don't think he's the kind of person to say that just to ingratiate himself. And I also, in my 27 years here in the USA, have noticed those centers of excellence as well. So I thought that would be um, 
a good point to, to end on. And uh, thank you very much for listening to that today. I hope it's interested you enough to go to some of these books um, and to um, go to some of the, uh, this particular YouTube, but there's a lot of other YouTubes out there on the internet. And if you do, because we don't have people, you know, physically present here, which normally when I present, we do. If you do have questions, please do email me and I will do my best to answer them. I like that interchange. I enjoy it. It keeps me up to the mark. So please do if you do have any questions. Thank you very much and looking forward to seeing you in person at some point. <laughs>